Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening for Insight Transcendent Poetry. I'm so excited for tonight. I think we're in for a real treat. My name is Leah. I'm from the Vancouver Public Library's Programming and Learning Team. I'd like to begin our evening by acknowledging that my home and the Vancouver Public Library are located on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And I am humbly grateful to call these lands home. And I thank the people of these nations for stewarding these lands since time immemorial. Before we get started, I was hoping to uh, tell you about some upcoming library events. One in particular, our Screen From Home program is back again this year with our Film Fridays feature film series. So this Friday, April 8th, you can use your special login to enjoy In the Heights based on the Broadway musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda and Chiara Alegria Hudes. This film shares the stories of Latino community members in the Washington Heights neighborhood of New York City. And the film is available all day, so you get to choose what time you watch it. This evening's Insight event is presented in partnership between the Vancouver Writers Fest, the Vancouver Public Library, and TELUS. And I will now invite you to please join me in welcoming Leslie Hertig, Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers Fest. Thank you so much, Leah, and good evening and welcome to our National Poetry Month celebration, Transcendent Poetry, featuring Shani Mutu, Tolu Olurantoba, and Jason Purcell in conversation with Shazia Hafiz Ramji. The Vancouver Writers' Festival would like to acknowledge that we carry out our work and this event here this evening on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And a big thanks goes out to our, incent, uh, our Insight event partners this evening, the Vancouver Public Library and TELUS for their collaboration and support, which make events like this free of charge to all of the viewers out there. Thanks also to our government sponsors, the Government of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts, the BC Government, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. This is our sixth Insight event of the season. And just a reminder that we host these events every other Wednesday until the beginning of June. If things go as planned, we will even be returning to some in-person Insight events at the Vancouver Public Library starting on May the 4th. But I'm glad to say that we will be live streaming those events for viewers who are outside of Vancouver or who wish to watch from the comfort of their own space. Soon, I shall turn things over to our host this evening. Shazia will talk with our three acclaimed poets before turning it over to you, our viewers, for your questions. Please submit those in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as possible before wrapping up in about an hour. I want to remind everyone that these three beautiful books are available at your favorite independent bookseller and otherwise purchasing these books they make a great gift to someone in your life for yourself makes us feel good in these times to buy a book of poetry and to spend some time poring over those 
I would like to say now, uh, to introduce now Shazia. Shazia Refuse Ramji is writing and has recent, her writing has recently appeared in Galleries West, Canadian Notes and Queries, and Quill and Choir. Her fiction was shortlisted for the Malahat Review's 2022 Open Seasons Award, and she was a finalist for the 2021 National Magazine Awards and the 2021 Mitchell Prize for Faith and Poetry. Port of Being is her award-winning first book of poems. She's a great friend of the festivals for her moderating and her eloquent way with conversations. We're so glad to have her here this evening. Please welcome Shazia. Hi, Leslie. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you everyone for tuning in. It's such a special night. I'm also tuning in from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, which I'm very privileged and grateful to call home. I'm very happy to be here with Tolu, Shani and Jason for Insight 2022, this Poetry Month of April. We're living in extraordinary times and I just want to take a second to just honor um, all of us being here together in this hour, in this light, in these blossoms, in this moment. And thank you so much to the VPL and Leslie Hurtig and the festival for bringing us all together so beautifully. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm quite excited for this event, uh, Transcendent Poetry, which is so fitting because all the poets are beyond poets in a way. You know, they're transcending poetry, even as they are poets. And you'll see what I mean in a second when I introduce them a little more in depth. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I'll invite the poets and I'll invite them to read a few poems each after the introductions. And after that, we'll have a conversation and uh, the chat will open up to audience questions around 7.40 or 10.40 if you're in Eastern time. And I'll keep, give you a cue for that. Our first poet this evening is Jason Purcell. And this is his first book, Swollening. Jason Purcell is a writer and musician from Amiskwasi, Waskahitan, Treaty 6, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, where they are also the co-owner of Glass Bookshop. As a chronically ill writer, Jason writes at the intersection of queerness and illness, and is the author of the chapbook, A Place More Hospitable. Swollening is their first full-length collection. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Shadia. Hi, Jason. I'm sorry I mispronounced your pronoun at the start. I forgot who preferred they. Our second reader for this evening is Tolu Olorontoba. Tolu was born in Ibadan, Nigeria and practiced medicine for his current work, managing projects with provincial health organizations. His poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in Harvard Divinity Bulletin, Prism International, Pleiades, Columbia Journal Online, Obsidian, the Maynard and the Humber Literary Review. It has also been nominated for the Pushcart Prizes. His debut chapbook, Maneuvering, was shortlisted for the 2020 BP Nichol Chapbook Award, while his debut collection of poems, The Junta of Happenstance, was published in spring 2021 by Palimpsest Press and is a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry. Tolo lives in Surrey, BC in the territories of the Samyamu, Katsi, and Kwantlen First Nations. Welcome Tolu, and welcome each one of Furness. Thanks, Jadia. Hi, everyone. Our final reader for this evening is Shani Mutu. Shani was born in Ireland, grew up in Trinidad, and lives in Prince Edward County, Ontario. She holds an MA in English from the University of Guelph, writes fiction and poetry, and as a visual artist, his work has been exhibited locally and internationally. Motu's critically acclaimed novels include Polar Vortex, Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, Valmiki's Daughter, He Drowned She in the Sea, and Sirius Blooms at Night, which is just reissued with Penguin Editions, I believe. Shani is a recipient of the KM Hunter Arts Award, a Chalmers Fellowship Award, and the James Duggins Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Award. Her poetry has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies and includes the collection, The Predicament of Ore. Her work has been long and shortlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the Dublin Impact Award, and the Booker Prize. Please welcome Shani Mutu and Kane Fire. Thank you. 
Jason, can I ask you to read some poems for us? It would be my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for that beautiful introduction. And, and it's so, um, oh, it's such an honor and, and pleasure to be here. And I, I do wanna thank Vancouver Writers Festival and, and BPL and everyone involved in making this happen. And it's such a delight to share space with these writers who I have just adored and admired. Um, so it's a real thrill. And, um, and like you said, I'm beaming in from uh, Miskawichiwa Skagen Treaty 6, Edmonton, Alberta. And some of you may not know, but uh, Vancouver Writers Festival's own Leslie Hertig is a hometown girl. So Edmonton says hi. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to read from my new book, Swollening, which is published by Arsenal Pulp Press, um, a dream publisher, and I, I feel very fortunate to, to be with them. So uh, the first poem that I'm going to read is called North of Nipissing Beach. I stood ankle deep in polite water, and there was wind coming over the trees and toward the camper where my mom and dad sat with friends I only recognize from one of their few wedding photos, by now out of its frame and discarded. Under the surface, my eyes darting little fish, so many and so quick, moving in leafy patterns, an arrangement that astounded, the memory astounds. Laughter from behind me, cigarette smoke, and fire, an adult world where I was a distraction. But here, ankles iced, such an enormous and quiet childhood. And then that sudden moving fish, two feet between mine, making eights around me, colossal muscle parting the water. It stayed until I called out wanting to be recognized by my parents for having been chosen. But by the time they set down their drinks, moved from their folding chairs, the fish was gone. And moving around me was the frustration of not being seen. Even this memory is clear. These are the terms of the space. And now I'm gonna read a poem called Verta Boys which is after um, an art exhibition by an Edmonton artist named Kyle Terrence, also called Berta Boys. A masculinity that cannot go further, the length of it more than its language, here, arms at the side and holding straight down, forgetting the lick that breezes over, smoke plumes, gravity makes itself known over a scene, an absence, a way of being gendered, some unsound distance smoking on the corner, pencil, and then something darker marking you, exposing you, the weight of balls pulling you down towards something you can't see, but that bruises nonetheless. And I think I will finish my reading with um, a poem called Men in the Gut because this collection is sort of interested in this intersection um, between sickness and queerness and, and thinking through masculinity and, and gender, particularly in, a, in, in an Albertan context. So men in the gut. Scrape the inside of sleep, the belly wall, tasting like yogurt, cooked broccoli, the emptiness of the organ, leaving its sour trace on the tongue, escaping the body that wants to quit from the inside. Your sick self unlaces you, all the tethers sliced away. When I dream of this body ending, of opening the germ of the pain, I am on the side of the road. My hands hold out my stomach, my second brain, to the men who already want me to die. This failing organ, quivering stomach with a ruby wound where everything settles, kissing your soft vulnerability, your core a target, where it is so easy to be stabbed or shot, a punch to the gut. I anticipate violence here, one cell layer deep, 
shallow spreading roots, a memory system in my body, on the side of the road, a drive-by for men, homophobic in trucks, swallowing spit. When I was a teenager, I let them disembody me, internalizing everything through the mouth, and now my stomach wants it out. I'm interested in self-diagnosis. When I dream, it is of trees budding from my stomach that will shade all the wounded men who masculinity failed, who will lay their oilers caps on my wrists, say I'm sorry, and their fingers will touch without their being afraid. Thank you. Oh, so moving and powerful. Thank you, Jason. Tolo, can I invite you to take the stage? Thank you so much, Shazia. Um, how's my audio uh, for starters? Is it good? Okay, thanks. Um, my thanks to the Vancouver Writers Fest for this um, for this honor. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, thanks to the team behind the scenes uh, for making this happen as well. Um, Shazia, thank you. I owe so much of this uh, journey in this country to you. Um, as I always say, I'm, I'm in your debt. Um, Shani, Jason, um, it's an honor to be reading with you tonight. Thank you for your wonderful poems, Jason. Uh, so I've been reading a number of poems now. The first poem is called, I'm reading from my, uh, my new uh, collection. It's called Each One of Furnace, uh, published um, last month by McLellan and Stewart. The first one I'm reading is called Wax Bill, The Death of David Oluwale. And some of the poems I reading today will uh, speak about death, violence, and, and possibly uh, abuse. It starts with an epigraph. During the trial, the judge, Mr. Justice Hinchcliffe, who at one point described Oluwale as a dirty, filthy, violent vagrant, directed the jury to find a defendant not guilty of manslaughter, perjury, and assaults occasioning grievous bodily harm. What we know. The black rumped wax bill found in African grasslands, sometimes landing further afield, is a bird of least concern, not a focus of species conservation. They do not qualify as threatened. The collective for a group of them is a trembling, Three, a trembling, David Olwale in the hall of the SS Temple Bar, the tailor's fabric in the wake of feet leaving the machine, the voyage, Lagos to Hall, the stowaways arrest after, the year 1949, the age 19, the 20 years following, the nightclub raid, the trunch into the head, the hallucinations in jail, the revenant beyond electroshocks, nights in the shut doorways of Leeds, the sneer of the garment district, the decade in mental hospitals, another as target of Ellerker and Kitching, and the charge sheets of Leeds' finest. A trembling, the last day, the chase by the riverbank, Billy Clubs, Ellerker and Kitching in pursuit, Oluwale, legs pumping by the river air, touchdown, splashback, a lack of trembling, rinses of vagrants, collection from the river. Now, this poem is about a, um, a Nigerian uh, immigrant to the UK uh, who was uh, persecuted by uh, local police um, uh, until he, uh, he died at their hands. Uh, just for some context. Next poem is called The Child's Other. I cut the placenta tree at the stem the child's phantom other a weight fallen after. They had asked me, do you want to cut the cord? Blood spraying the shielding palm. Do you want to cut away spices pressed to newborn mouths? Pressing significances into progeny. Do you want to cut down farms on ritual supply routes? Honey for the sweetness some call joy. Good fortune from an alligator's peppers pods. Palm oil, antidote of antidotes. Lubricant for the path, the cola not spat toward evil, salts to season a life, bitter cola to lengthen it, and water we not get enemy. Do you want to cut out night burials of arcane afterbirths, the knowing where a placenta is planted, the hiding it oneself away from jealous potion makers or its owner forever, a child's skeleton key? Do you want to cut off the homeland? 
Next poem is called Rise, Kill, and Eat. When I hear let's divide and conquer in project management meetings, I wince and remember the British Dyson knife. The nurturing instinct I see is also a murderous instinct because parents, those notorious drivers of minivans, kill for their children. In this essay, I will demonstrate the soil green operation of international trade, its battery cages of battery cages, my own family in ochre pajamas in the infinite condominium array. Macroeconomics measures the methane doses of jailbirds, renovates old growth forests into cul-de-sacs for its workers, installs in a sense as carbon filters in the earth, and calibrates the volumes of domestic and corporate life. But 200 years into the revolution of industry, the furnace is demanding more meat. The daily hunt and exercise areas can therefore not be cruelty free. We are thankfully the non-renewable scourge of this planet. That we are beasts with useful beasts of our own in crates does not mean we do not harbor insurrection. Etheridge saw the globe for what it was, a penitentiary of cast iron meridians and latitudes the billionaires trying in vain to escape. People invite poets for arson. If cowardice is our seagull, it is because we had no other choice. If our jumpsuits can burn monoxide blue in cake ovens, could we die, but preferably kill wardens for our children? Cue the alarms, the barometer, the eschaton of our fallen bodies. Portrait of the artist as Gouldian chick in free fall from the nest. To say I lived a sheltered life also means I was sheltered from safety, from hands that could have saved me from the barbed crown of his nest. I was protected from leaving, from other comforts but the soft between trampling talons. I stabbed myself with the edge of escape. I have by now fallen halfway across the planet I will myself heavier, farther away from the Keenan calling me back. In the percussion of air currents, I asked searches the talking drums beside my eyes with a tritonic song for me, which I would bear had I not slashed my skins, had I not drawn shades over my nictitating membranes, had I repeated the chants prepared for me, had I aimed upward instead, the shotgun blasts of my feathers. Next one is Galapagos. It's about the uh, finches on the Galapagos Islands that each um, evolve on different islands depending on their food sources. Out of Ninia's hand, Ignis plate, fickle water. A seed goes in, we grow, each generation its own intermediate of insensibly graduated beaks. A song comes out when we find a food we can find. The food says what our mouths look like. Our mouths say what our songs sound like. Our songs say how and if the hunting party finds us. Our jaws have mouths for each season, the greater number jet black and brown, each island of dispersion, whatever quaver closest to the key of demand. I'll end on that note. That was devastating, Tolu. Thank you so much for those poems. Thank you, Shasta. I'd like to welcome Shani now with Cane Fire, her first book of poetry in over 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. Welcome, Shani. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, the, um, the very first writer's festival that I ever read at was at the, the Vancouver Writers' Festival in about uh, 1996. And it holds a really special place in my heart for me. So I'm really, really pleased to be here again. And uh, I want to say thank you to Leslie for asking me. And, uh, it, and also um, the Vancouver uh, Public Library, that beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, you know, I used to live in Vancouver and I really miss the place terribly. I'm so glad to, uh, to be connected tonight. And... Uh, Wow, it's so good to be with you, Jason, and with you, Tolu, and Shazia. Really, really good to be with you. Um, I am going to uh, read um, 
from my book Cane Fire. But unfortunately, you know, what it's there are a lot of images and so on, a lot of my artwork in it. And so that's the kind of thing that I can't read, uh, you know, but I'm going to show you there's this like this sort of thing here. This particular poem, it goes um, the inevitable and this side says what my eyes see. I turn the page and then it's theater. And here's the same you know, a, a similar image, but there's a canoe. And then this one is um, of desire, I dream of doing. So it's um, what my eyes see, I dream of doing, the inevitable theater of desire. And now I'm gonna read some wordy stuff. This one is called Ancestry. My mother was an Anglican. My father was a priest. Together they prayed real hard. When spring came and the pitch lake overflowed, they reaped the smoothest stones you've ever seen. This one is called Veranda. From city eaves dangled Jack Spaniard's papery nests, like schoolboys term tests crumpled, tossed and caught in the black painted wrought iron garden that rose above rows of pots of curly leafed bread and cheese begonia, lushly fringing the wraparound black ledged veranda. And though your belly was full of cake and milk, you pressed each shell pink pillow of begonia for a soupçon smear of yolk yellow citrus sour and waited. And as you waited, you contemplated mechanics of de-stinging, principles of taming, red-bellied, yellow-banded Jack Spaniards. Then slowly below, begins the babbling and the flow. You crouch behind your potted jungle and watch. The charm of girls in green skirts and white blouses glimmer through the latticed doors of a white-walled madrasa, whose golden star and crescent moon shine brighter than heaven's own stars and earth's own moon. And you marvel at how hummingbirds know why the musin sings and why at this time on the street below, white capped men in white dresses flow. And here's another one of those that I'm going to read it to you, but I'm gonna show you. I don't know if you can see, but um, it's in the gutter and it's mirrored. So it's the line of the, the poem goes down one word, down the line and then it's mirrored on the other side. It's called fine white linen. Fine white line, barely visible. Line, white, fine. Honor thy mother and thy father buried in fine white linen. Finally, I'll read you 2,540 miles. Upon her tongue, the phantom marble twirls in foreign beds, absent stretches full length beside her. The cane ashed town, ticklish lover, jealous custodian, a blur in sepia. Nights, she bolts upright, skin sticky with recall. The window open, no air a swirl. The Syrian, his bicycle, the bell bellowed his wares, olive oil, ylang ylang, clothespins, better be. A sari flutters in the sky, loop de loops, disambiguates the sitar's drone. On her side of spare tipped fences, painted silver, pink poinsettia. On the other side, the silver haired drunk man 
A handsome man wailed for his glass-eyed mother. Blind birds flew through came fire sweetened air. Between thumb and forefinger, a phantom of marble, crimson air, out of the wound of night seeps chimera. Absence, a clever lover, supine beside her. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. The images are just flooding my field of vision. <laughs> Thank you. So I want to dive right in and talk about how striking it is that in all of your work, um, there's a kind of poetry of the moment, um, almost like you're building the poem around a moment in time, when you're kind of retelling a moment in time like a vignette. Um, I'm thinking of the speaker crouched behind the bushes in the veranda poem, Shani, or the blind birds flying through cane sweetened air, and Tolu, the shotgun blast of the Goldian chick in your poem, and Jason, the fish making figure eights in your poem. So I was wondering, you know, how do you find, how do you find the occasion for your poems? How did you know that this was the moment you wanted to write about? Or did you even know that when you began? How did that emerge? Shall I jump in? Oh, sorry, Jason, you were going to? Oh, Ariane. please, I would love to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, you know, I think the way that I write comes, uh, comes very much from my visual art practice from decades ago. And um, what, uh, something I've trained myself to do um, long before I was writing publicly was to catch images you, you, you know, we, um, we sort of have these subconscious things floating in our heads that mean nothing or seem to mean nothing, um, phrases or images and so on. And what I try to train myself to do is to catch them and hold on to them. And to, they, they often begin a work for me. And uh, if, I, if I impose too much of, of an agenda on them to try to make them make too much meaning out of them. I lose it. I, I really lose them. They just, you know. But if I listen and let them flow, I will get material that I then can come in as the either the artist or the writer, and then you know, and then turn them into something. A lot of composting, a lot of composting and interdisciplinary processes there. Yeah. And it's so, I'm going to out myself as a Shani Mutu super fan now because I had been thinking about that precisely. Um, I remember, I think, in another interview, you had said that, um, yeah, that writing poetry felt more like your visual arts practice than, say, your fiction writing process, even though, you know, they're writing and people might think that those two bump each other maybe more comfortably and um and I'm not a visual artist and I and I wish I was because it's just like this this um this art form that I just I find so kind of excavatory and, and revelatory at the same time and I feel like poetry does sort of offer that that for me and I think that in the poems that I read tonight and, and many of the other poems in the collection like they're, they're spurred by these visual reminders. Like um, it's a photograph in North Nipissing Beach that sort of, uh, that I didn't even remember. I didn't remember being there, but there I was. And then I, I sort of wrote that scene and then there I was in a whole other way. And, um, or with Berta Boys, you know, seeing that, um, that exhibition awakened in me like a kind of visual language that was saying to me via the art, what I was trying to say in my writing. And it was just sort of like making these sort of connections between um, one type of artistic practice and another, and then maybe a conversation between um, me as, as a writer and a memory or someone else's work that, that yeah, that uh, is a space of recovery, maybe in more than one sense of a word too, because it allows me to sort of find the space where that maybe I turned away from or, uh, hadn't yet had the ability to kind of write through or think through. 
So I was, I'm very happy that you talked about your artistic practice there because that was just such a spark for me when I came across that interview where you had said that. Mm -hmm. Just gonna totally steal from uh, you know Shani and, and Jason and say, um, I try to step out of, uh, I try to get out of the way of my conscious mind. Um, and Shani, you know, you had said, um, you know, you try not to impose an agenda on, on, on the images. And that's very true for me. Um, I'd heard somewhere that, you know, every single memory, every single thing that has ever happened to everyone is there in our brains. Um, we just can't access those memories, all of them readily. Um, and so sometimes, you know, a, a poem really begins with an image that, you know, jugs something in that uh, junkyard of my mind um, and you know one thing falls and something else falls on it and you know there's a bit of an avalanche in one corner and I try to just gather those images in my notes app <laughs> and just keep them there for a while uh, and a few more occur to me and I just put them there as well and you know after a while I can go back and try to see what it means <laughs> um, and try to you know pick my way through it and and um and then see if it's saying something. I, I do feel that whenever I try to be a poet, like I try to say, um, I, I know how to write a poem. I find that I, I can't, I don't, I, if you tell me to write a poem on demand, I will not be able to. <laughs> so I just try to uh, see what's truer than my consciousness, than my frontal lobe, I'll say, you know, um, and just try to trace that truth um, in, in the poems. Collecting it all for the junkyard. I'm definitely coming to this jumble sale when it happens. <laughs> but Tony, you said a really interesting thing right now, which builds on what Shani was saying about the respect for the unconscious and that line about the memories, almost exactly like a line in one of Jason's poems. Um, Jason, you wrote about the memory system of the body in your poem, Men in the Gut. You said, um, a punch to the gut. I anticipate violence here, one cell layer deep, shallow spreading roots, a memory system in my body. And totally, you also address this kind of, a, a kind of violence um, through this divide and conquer dynamics of colonization and the death of David Olawale and Shani, your poem about grief and the fine white linen and the fine white line, so moving. I wanna ask, how do you write about, how do you write about illness? How do you write about homophobia, about violence, direct and direct violence, and about grief? How do you find your way into writing these difficult experiences and accessing the memory system of the body? If I can pick on your line, Jason. Um, I think for me, something that I've discovered about poetry, um, the more that I try to write it is that you know it has its own logics and its own senses and and in my experience these um these violences and you know, sickness homophobia external internal violence um these kind of all like lack a sort of logic and sense when you try to um break them down explain them to yourself or line them up historically i mean it just requires such a an amassing of, of histories and of experiences and I feel like there are other forms of writing that that are so important that kind of hold all of that in a very different way than poetry does. I feel like poetry asks you only to know what you know in that moment and and not have to um, not have to sort of explain so much. you can just sort of be in that state. you can be in that kind of suspended state which in itself is sort of a beautiful and 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 hurtful place to be all at the same time and so for me to find a place that I, I didn't have to um uh, you know where I could just sort of I don't know I'm like kind of fumbling in my words here but it didn't instruct me or direct me in any particular way it sort of just existed in its own in own place and that I think relieved some of the pressure on me to um to represent pain or violence or sickness in any way other than how it is and how it kind of landed on my own body. Yeah, the truth of the lived experience, right? Tolu or Shani? Uh, Shani unmuted first. <laughs> so Shani no, no, went, no, go ahead, Tolu, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Right. yeah, Jason, you know, you were talking about the, uh, you know, the, the gut being this, you know, I think there's a reference to God being the second brain, and and you know it's it's very true. You know, 
when we talk about traumatology, how trauma has a res residual effect in our bodies. And, and then, you know, when you see something that, that, that reminds you of violence or, or that puts you back in that place, you, your, your body responds in a certain way to try to protect you from that oncoming danger. And, and sometimes when I'm writing about, about violence, um, it, it is very exhausting for me because uh, sometimes it puts me back there, um, you know, with, with the trauma. Um, but I'm also careful not to try to, uh, you know, you know, as Jason said, you know, in, in, instruct that I'm not trying to um, sensationalize. I'm not trying to, um, um, I'm not trying to impose anything on it. I'm just trying to be true to that experience. And I found that when I read poets that are very evocative, they, I feel that instant empathy, that instant um, kinship with 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 the emotions that they're describing and so i i just feel um it's all about fidelity like um how true is what you're saying how, how true is it um to you know the imagined or real scenario that you're describing um that's the only um that's that, that's the main i'll say yardstick that i use to uh, to to measure that high fidelity for sure yeah and that's Truth can vary in so many ways. I'm going to let Shani speak though. So I, I have similar, um, uh, my answer would involve similar things that the two of you have said. Um, but what I would add to that is that, um, so it's been a long time that I've been communicating um, through either visual material or written work and so on, communicating uh, and I guess from the time I was a child, trying to get others to listen to certain things, difficult things that they didn't want to listen to. And so from very, very young, you know, Shazi, it's very interesting. These questions that you ask and that are asked on stage, they're not questions that, that I'm answering when I'm writing. They're I'm, you know, I'm not um, paying attention to them when I'm actually writing, but when you ask them, they're so interesting. And I realize uh, now in having to answer it, that in fact, um, there is a, a sort of a, a history inside of myself to how I, 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 I write and work. And this, I think um, going back to, you know, to, to childhood, trying to find ways to be heard. Screaming gets you no way, I've learned. I've also learned that in activism on the street here in, well, when I was in Vancouver and I used to do, um, uh, you know, a lot of um, activism where w w I noticed that if you scream, people couldn't hear you, they, they turned away. So one of the things that I tried to do is to, both be the person speaking and the person hearing at the same time. And, um, and to also know that whatever grief I have, even if somebody, whether it's about racism, whether it's about loss or homophobia or whatever, even if someone has not experienced those, they've experienced some aspect of loss or, or discrimination in one way or the other. And so if I find a way to express it that includes them, not includes their experience, but includes their hearing. So, yeah, I mean, the thing I love about poetry is that, you know, you can, you, you don't have to give every single detail, every single cause and effect thing. It's a real, meeting of the hearts really more than even the minds so yeah such beautiful of us to sort of close on i just want to open the chat to audience questions before i ask you about your books as a whole so please post your questions in the chat if you've got any i, I'm, I know we, you do um please post it in the youtube chat and joy swan from the writers festival will pass them to me and Tolo, Shani, and Jason, I guess this might be my last question for you. But, you know, we've talked so much about um, poetry in depth, and I want to talk about your books. What was the actual process of the book as a whole? 
you know, uh, Shani, if this is your first poetry collection over 20 years, and Tolu, this is just on the heels of the Jantav happenstance, and Jason, this is your first book, period. So this is uh, exciting to see such a range of books here. And I'm curious to know, how did you, how long did you take to write these books? And how did you know to stop, to when to say, you know, this book is a book, <laughs> and this is what I'm going to call it? I could just jump in and say, you never know when to stop adding poems to the book. Well, well, I, I could speak for myself, but just before the book went to press, while, while the book was being, uh, after the book was typeset, you know, I was still changing. <laughs> I was still changing things. And, I, and at some point, very close to the end, I, I kind of added three poems to it. Uh, so, you know, if they didn't stop me, I would just keep adding more poems or taking poems out. So it's, it's good that a book is out in the world and it's out of my hands now. <laughs> and I could put the poems in the next one. Uh, but I, I, I wrote most of the book in 2019. Um, you know, um, after I'd read at, at VPL at, um, at that reading that you organized, Shazia, and then we started talking about, you know, Dion Branzo series, um, you know, in, in, in the DMs. That, and, you know, when I read that, uh, the images of finches there just, you know, set me down a, a fantastic path. Um, and incidentally, I, I, I was laid off from my job at that time. So I had some months, I had about six months to, uh, <laughs> to read and write. Uh, so I was able to, you know, delve into those images a bit more um, and build it out and then look at some unrealized poems of mine and uh, see if I could use that lens of, you know, transience, ornithology, um, you know, instability and so forth to, to, to pick out the poems that could fit. Uh, but I mostly wrote it very quickly, perhaps because I was so distressed and uh, you know unemployed and very poor. Uh, so this is all I was doing. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, yeah, wrote most of it over one year. But the other ones that I added, I'd written over like the 10-ish the years that, that preceded that. Um, and so that's my answer. Amazing how far those finches have flown. <laughs> Jason and Shani? Um, sure. I, I started writing the poems that, that ended up becoming this book uh, while I was still writing my master's thesis. So that was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 2018. Um, and it was the first time that I was writing about uh, or attempting to kind of theorize my own experiences with sickness and queerness and homophobia, masculinity, gender, all of these kind of big themes that are happening in, in my book. And I just kind of found myself coming against something over and over, like just some obstacle. Maybe I was, maybe I was afraid of, of kind of really confronting these these subjects kind of semi publicly for the first time because I hadn't really published um, by at that time any way at all. And this is like you know, it's going in front of a committee. There are people kind of assessing your worth. Like, are you going to get the degree? Who knows? And so I just kind of felt all this immense pressure. And so I started writing these poems like at the beginning of every writing session. Like so, before doing any sort of academic writing or engaging with any theory. I would just like sit myself down and let myself kind of play with the ideas and the language um, in a way that was not academic. It wasn't, it didn't fit those formal constraints at all. It didn't um, check any of those boxes. It was just something that I was able to do to sort of find a different angle in um, to my body, into these experiences, into these ideas. So like, I, and I think I remember finding like a Lacan quote around that time because I was in grad school and it was something about like, um, you're not going to poetry um, for wisdom, but you instead go to it for like the dismantling of wisdom. And there was something about that that I really felt like that's what I needed. Like I needed to go someplace that um, allowed me sort of to take apart what was felt very rigid for me and just play with the raw materials. So that's how this book came to be. And I did get my master's in the end. So we, we can all feel <laughs> relief about that. And that's when I stopped. <laughs> Thank you. Congrats, Jason. It's so fascinating how both of you and Tolo are sort of escaping from, you know, the, the mundane, mundanities of life and work and school to write poems, almost like poetry is a necessity, like Audre Lorde says, right? And Shani, what about you? 20 years. Well, I've been writing, um, you know, um, poetry all the time. And after I finished um, Polar Vortex, I felt 
like it was still being edited and I felt like, you know, it's time to put all of those poems that I've been writing since the predicament of or into a package and see if uh, Book Hub would be interested in publishing them. So I gave it to them before, uh, before Polar Vortex came out and they accepted it. And um, when, um, when Polar Vortex came out, I, when I was finished with it, I just felt a kind of freedom, a tremendous freedom. I felt like I'd finally written the way that I wanted. I'd gone back to writing the way I had written Sirius Blooms at Night. I, I was writing more like an artist rather than trying to be a writer. And um, Book Hug said, yes, they would take the poems, but that freedom that I felt also made me want to toss those poems. And I did. And I, I began to work on another manuscript, which, which is what Cane Fire is, with a lot of artwork and so on. And I, every few days I would be sweating, I would be cold sweating and thinking, this is not what they accepted. I wonder if they will take it on or they'll tell me no, sorry, you know, in the end. And uh, when I showed them the final thing um, with all the images and so on, thinking this is gonna cost them some money to, to print. You know, I don't know if they're gonna want to do this. I just couldn't believe they just, they were so great. And they, um, you know, they, they, choose, they chose the right paper. They gave me a fantastic editor, a fantastic uh, designer. And um, they just put a lot of effort into it. And yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> and Shani, can I ask you if um, these, the artwork that's in your book, are they actual like on canvas or are you collaging them on paper? How did they, what are they like in life and how was it reprinting them for the book? So this is the other part of the story. When I was living in Vancouver, Xerox Canada gave me access to a massive, massive machine in their, main, in, in their main um, building. And they gave me like a residency for three months. And I, these are Xerox works that some of them have been shown, but many of them were not shown. Uh, like the one that I showed you, uh, the, the um, inevitable theater of desire that had never been shown. And in this, in this book, I just felt like, you know, it's time for me to just absolutely do what I want to do. And it, whether it works or not, it doesn't matter. I have to do this. I just have to do this. And whenever I feel that way about a work, I know it's going to work. It's going to, you know, it's going to work out well. So yeah, yeah. And sometimes it can be so hard to get to that place too, right? Of trusting the unconscious. I feel like it's a path yeah. to get there. And maybe this connects to one of the audience questions that we have from Cynthia Cole. Uh, Cynthia is asking, in what way has your spiritual philosophy or practice influenced your writing? My spiritual philosophy. Um, so I, 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 I practice Buddhism and I guess you could see it in, in my work. Um, and as I was saying before, it is about wanting to communicate and not scream, but to hear the other person, to communicate with the other person and to know, to recognize that what, uh, what I am experiencing is not special. Any of my hurts are not special. It's just part of the human condition that we all have. And it's, you know, so uh, that's. Um, that's the, the main thing is to be um, to be considerate of the person that I would like to scream at, but to know that they are they have their own sufferings as well. And Tolo and Jason, does spiritual practice or philosophy inform your poetry, sense of divinity? That's, uh, I'll lead more towards the you know the philosophy part than than the practice part. You know, so you know I I quote the. Bible, I'd say a lot in, in my writing, but my spiritual philosophy is questioning, like I, I question everything. Um, and that's very useful in poetry because nothing is uh, beyond the realm of being interrogated. So, you know, it's like, well, why this? Are you sure? Who told you? Um, why do we have to put up with this? Why is this this way? This is wrong, you know? Um, and, and so that questioning has been my, um, 
spiritual uh, temperature for at least the last 15 years in which, you know, um, everything that I thought I knew, uh, I am beginning to challenge. Um, and so I, I do bring that in my work, that skepticism or sometimes cynicism or curiosity, but it's, it's all questioning. You know, Tolu, I, um, I'm not a Christian, Buddhist, as I said, but oh, so many of my poems have um, hymns, Christian hymns in them. It's, it, it's, it's so, so you know, yeah, honestly, it's so rich, really. Uh, and sometimes I just can't help myself. <laughs> Jason, I want to hear from you, too. Is there a spiritual practice or philosophy that informs your work or approach to poetry? Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not quite as evolved as the other two here today. So I can't really say that there's a spiritual sort of um, practice or, or um, sort of mind frame that I that I helps orient my work or my way of being even. But um, again, Shani Mutu, super fan. I am very inspired and I would like, I'm maybe going to aspire to what you sort of um, gesture toward, which is compassion toward um toward those who may not see you the way that you ought to be seen. Um, and I think maybe, maybe my answer to this question, um, when it comes to my book, which is about sickness, like so much about, about these kind of alienating and um, um, pathologized um, ways of being, is maybe that, I, maybe that I try to let myself learn to like live alongside it. Um, and the same goes with with queerness or, or or gender or anything to to not seek a cure for everything and that not everything it needs to be pathologized. Some things are just like, as Shani said, like these are kind of problems that are not unique to me um, and that they also aren't things that need to be fixed or cured necessarily. Um, they can just be things that um, I, that are part of my life that I can aspire to accept and and be with. It's such a strange double bind, I think, that poets have to face is that, you know, you have to at once realize your insignificance in the larger scheme of things, but then in order to write, it has to feel kind of important to you. And I feel like that's where the spirituality aspect can come in, because like being spiritual is really kind of um, like a form of attention in a way where it makes everything sacred. And so when you're writing poems, right, all of your poetry is just so specific. Like we talked about the moment and building around the moment, there's kind of sacredness of the everyday there. Um, I'm going to jump to one more question before I hand it off to Leslie to close us off. But there's a question here from Serena Bandur and she's asking, what would you say the difference is between transcendence and escapism? or repression of the self in your poetry? What would you say the difference is between transcendence and escapism or repression of the self of your poetry? We're getting really heady today. That is so layered that I'm having to think. <laughs> I, I don't think that they are, I think there are different modes of being, that's, that, that's, that, that would be my first attempt at answering it. Um, I, I'll think of it like a dial somewhat. Um, sometimes, you know, as someone with a, with a panic disorder, uh, uh, sorry, with an anxiety disorder, I have, um, I, I, I have used poetry uh, as an escape, both in reading and writing it. Um, I, I'm trying to transcend my, my circumstances. I, I believe there has to be more than this nonsense, meaning the way we live. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to transcend the, uh, the incongruity of, 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 of life and, and existence. I'm not necessarily trying to transcend, uh, become a transcendent, transcendent being, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 as to move myself beyond the constraints, uh, mental and otherwise, you know, that have been placed upon me. Uh, and, and the third one was um, repression. I think that in trying to tap into my subconscious, I am, I'm trying to, I'm undoing a lot of the repression that, that, that has occurred. Um, trauma helps, trauma sometimes erases some parts of your memory or, or makes them inaccessible you know, to you. And sometimes I'm writing and, and as Jason said, you know, I don't, I, 
I hadn't wanted to remember this, but it's coming back to me. So in a way it undoes the repression that, you know, uh, that my subconscious uh, has, has, has done to me. Um, so I, I would say it's an escape from that. Um, so that's my scattered uh, answer. I just picked up parts of it. Uh, <laughs> I'll just hand it off to Shani and Jason. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I would, I, I find it's an interesting question because when I first started writing poetry, I would say that perhaps I tried to um, discover uh, or to dis discover things about myself, but there was an attempt to obfuscate meaning. You know, you want to write, you want to write yourself into existence, but you don't want anybody else to know what you're saying. And where I've come right to at this point is that I absolutely want um, what I want, what I am thinking and feeling and saying and, you know, so on, to be there, right there. I don't want to escape. I don't want to transcend. And um, I'm not trying to repress at all, it really is about communicating, you know. And I, I did want to say, Jason, that that the last poem that you read is is one that I have read before, and the last line of it, um, not line, the last um, sentence of it, as it were, um, about dreaming, you know, the I don't remember, I can't remember the words, but to my mind, that is total compassion. That is total compassion um, for yourself and for the other person, uh, or for the for the other people in the in the truck or whatever. You know, they, it, it was really really beautiful. So, them is my thoughts. Well, thank you. I guess I transcended. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, that's my answer is that I have transcended. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think this would be a perfect time to close since we've all transcended uh, metaphorically, I hope. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Shani, Tolu, and Jason for being so generous with your responses you. and for Thank the you. questions in the chat. Yeah. I'm going to invite Leslie to say goodnight to us well before we head off to our tea in bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, especially for Shani in your time zone there. Um, this is what I love about April, an entire month that is devoted to poetry like this and beautiful conversations like the one we've had here tonight. Thank you so much to all four of you for joining us tonight and uh, for celebrating the written word this way. Um, again, these books are available at your favorite store. Thank you to uh, its book hug. Arsenal Pulp Press and McClellan and Stewart for making the visits of these authors possible here this evening and for investing in poetry and putting out beautiful works like these. Thank you. And um, thank you to our viewers for joining us tonight. Wishing you all the best as you launch these new titles out into the world. I hope you get to read from them frequently and uh, to, to appreciative audiences. Thank you, Shazia, for being such a wonderful host tonight. As usual, I loved listening to your questions and, and the answers. Thank you, everybody, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Hope to Good night. see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.